All right, we're in the book of Matthew. If you turn there, it doesn't matter what chapter because we're going to talk about the whole book. Book of Matthew. As we continue our series that we just started the first Sunday of the year, we're now on our third lesson concerning New Testament survey. In our first lesson, we gave an overview of the whole Bible. Last time, we gave an overview of the New Testament. Now we're going to go book by book, probably give, um, each, each book will give a lesson to. Maybe we'll do some lessons with several books, but um, we want to give an overview of each book. Uh, of the New Testament. And there'll be other men along the way teaching in this class. I won't be teaching necessarily every week, but we're just getting this series started. So um, let's start. Uh, and I, I say Matthew, we're going to get there, but let me just review a little bit. Um, God chose four men, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to write an historical record of the earthly life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, there are features that are common to all four, but there are also distinctions. And um, giving a portrait of Christ, it's like a three-dimensional view. It's one thing if you take a picture of somebody just straight ahead. It's something else when you have uh, take a picture of them looking at their face, this side, that side, even the back of their head, a, a four four views there, it gives us this, this great portrait of the Lord Jesus, and the four records do not contradict each other. Uh, if you ever think you find a contradiction, and a lot of times people say there are contradictions in the Bible, a lot of times they'll go to the gospel records, and there are apparent contradictions, but they're all cleared up by believing Bible study. Uh, I've never, and I, I've pretty much, I think, seen all of them uh, that people use to try to say there are contradictions, and there's an answer to all of it. And uh, so the problem is not with the Bible, it's with your attitude, if you think you found an error in it. Um, they, the, the four Gospels do not contradict. What they do is they complement. Okay? And they don't have to be exactly the same. I think there are some accounts that people try to harmonize and say... Well, this is the same account with some different information, and that may be true sometimes. Sometimes it's just a different account. And uh, you don't have to force these books to match exactly. Uh, I, don't, I don't see the need to try to harmonize uh, the four records. They, they, they are in perfect harmony. We don't have to try to help them. And, uh, and I don't necessarily hold to the view that's so popular among theologians. They say Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic Gospels, and then John... It's kind of written much later, and it's, and it's so different. Well, <clears throat> and I'm not going to get into all that, why they say that about the synoptics and all that. But obviously, if John is emphasizing Jesus Christ as God, that would be a pretty distinct thing, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, uh, God is far above all, and John is, is unique as compared to the other three, but they go together, Okay. And they're all dealing with the earthly life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we mentioned in our last study, each of the gospel records has a different emphasis. And that's in accordance with Old Testament prophecy. Christ is presented as Matthew, excuse me, as king in Matthew, as servant in Mark, as son of man in Luke, and son of God in John. Now, that's the emphasis of those books. That's not to say Christ is not seen as the king in Luke and so forth. I mean, it's, he's presented similarly in all of them, but because he is who he is and he did what he did, but, but the different writers have a different emphasis. And we showed you from prophecy that fourfold picture. But I want to give you, to start off with this morning, just, a, just two examples of, of scriptural proof from the Gospels themselves about this emphasis uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, most of y'all heard that. Matthew, King, Mark, Servant, Luke, Son of Man, John, Son of God. And it's true. That's one of those things that people actually get right, I think, a lot of time when they're trying to teach the Gospels, okay? Now, here... The, the, way, the way the Gospels open and the way they close. Now, I can give you a lot of other examples in between, but 
you know, I want to get to the book of Matthew this morning, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but the Gospels open with, with you could say, his lineage, and it, they close with his ascension. Okay, so look at this. You have the lineage of Christ. In Matthew, his genealogy is traced through the royal line back to Abraham. And um, understanding Matthew's purpose and what he's writing, that makes a whole lot of sense. And um, it's traced through um, Joseph in Matthew and then Mary in Luke. And there's some distinctions there in the genealogies because of that. But in Mark, there's no genealogy. Uh, and the record of his service begins immediately. And by the way, that word immediately is a key word in, in Mark. I mean, it's just a fast-moving book. And I mean, when you read the book of Mark, you know, you're not very far into the first chapter until his, his ministry already starts. I mean, it gets right to it. In Luke, his genealogy is traced all the way back to Adam. Okay, that makes sense, seeing as he's presented as the Son of Man. And John, there's no genealogy. Obviously, he's God. And John starts off, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I mean, what, a, what an opening. I mean, God has no genealogy, so you see that. All right, now what about the ascension? In Matthew, there's no ascension recorded. As the king of the Jews, his, his place, his position is on the earth. And uh, in Mark, it's interesting how the last verse, after he ascends up, it talks about him working with his disciples. The emphasis is still on his work. He, he ascended up to continue his work through his apostles. And then in Luke, it says he was carried up into heaven. Very specific terminology there. Carried up implies that he, was, he ascended up by the power of the Father. Now, we know in other verses he ascended up in his own power. But it's also true he ascended up in the power of the Father. And him being presented as the Son of Man, I, I just like the way that's worded. He was carried up into heaven. And then in John, of course, there is no ascension recorded because he's the omnipresent God. And so you see how the Gospels open and close. And then there's a lot of examples uh, in the Gospel records that show this different emphasis. Now, much more could be said about the Gospel records as a whole, but let's go ahead this morning and begin with our look at uh, them individually. And we're going to look at Matthew today with the time we have. Um, look at Matthew 9. And we're going to be skipping around at different verses in Matthew. But Matthew was a publican, uh, which basically is a tax collector for the Roman government. But he was a Jew, and so he was very despised by the Jews for being that tax collector for the Roman government. He, he was a publican when Christ called him to be his disciple. And then he became one of the twelve apostles. Matthew 9, verse number 9, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he's a tax collector. That's what that's referring to. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. Then look in chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits. So he's sending them forth. He had other disciples, but there's 12 in particular that he sends forth with special authority. And so from this point on, they're apostles, meaning sent ones. They're sent forth directly by Christ. Real apostles are those who, who saw the Lord and were sent forth by the Lord. Now, Paul saw the Lord from heaven and was sent forth from heaven. And his, of course, apostleship is different from these who are called on earth. But it says, He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, the names of the twelve apostles, you notice that? So He's sending them forth. They're the twelve disciples, but now the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican. 
And uh, James, the son of Alphaeus and Levius, whose surname is Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who, is also, who also betrayed him. Judas is always mentioned last when the apostles are listed. And I think Peter's always listed first. Look at verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth, okay, apostles, sent forth directly by Jesus, and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. And as I've told you often, it's not because he didn't care about the Gentiles. It was because according to prophecy, Israel had to be blessed first. They had to be saved first and then they will be a kingdom of priests to the nations. They are to reach the nations. Uh, but So he begins here with them. And there's an order. And there's a distinction. Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter you not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach. Saying, what is their message? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now note that because that is the theme of Matthew. The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king is present. His, his kingdom is near. If they'll receive him, I mean, it being at hand means that it is right there at the door. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the gospel of the kingdom, the good news about this kingdom that God promised Israel. And so with this kingdom, there are signs that point to it. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. And they did all of that. And they did it in reality. And they never struck out. They, 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 they had a powerful ministry by the power of God. And these signs were of that kingdom. Because in that kingdom, there's going to be health and wealth and prosperity. He said, freely you've received, freely give, and so on. So, here's Matthew. He was a publican. He becomes a disciple. And then he's chosen to be one of the twelve. He will be one of the twelve princes. That will judge the twelve tribes of Israel in the kingdom. Matthew 19. I mean, this is literal. They're, they're literally, these apostles are not just preachers, you know, like I am. They're not just like a pastor. These are princes. And they're going to sit on twelve thrones in the kingdom, literally. Matthew 19, 28. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, and he's talking to the twelve, in the regeneration, and that's got to do with His kingdom, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory. See, He's not, he's not seated there now. He's at the right hand of the Father, seated with His Father in His Father's throne, the Bible says. But He's coming to the earth to take the throne of David, which rightfully belongs to Him because He's the Son of David. He said, Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones. Judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Those twelve thrones are just as literal as the twelve tribes of Israel. You don't need to spiritualize it at all. It is what it is. So, the book of Matthew then was written by a Jewish apostle about a Jewish Christ and his Jewish kingdom. Okay? And if you don't understand that, you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble doctrinally. And, of course, a lot of people don't understand that. And hence, you have so much bad teaching Coming out of Matthew. And it's not God's fault. It's not the Bible's fault. It's men misunderstanding and misinterpreting and not rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, concerning Matthew, there are 23 quotes, direct quotes of the Old Testament. And 76 references to the Old Testament. And just 28 chapters. So you have about 100 clear references to the Old Testament. And the phrase that it might be fulfilled, it occurs ten times. The phrase, which was spoken, occurs fourteen times, and there are other similar phrases like that. So constantly it's referring back. And you're not going to have a clue what Matthew's about if you don't understand what God was doing in the Old Testament. Because technically, Matthew is still on that same ground of Old Testament. Okay, There's no New Testament until the blood of Christ is shed. Now, The church, which is the body of Christ, of course, was a mystery hidden God until revealed through the Apostle Paul. And that has to do with his eternal purpose for the heavenly places. But Matthew's all about God's purpose for the earth. 
Therefore, the book of Matthew is not written to or about us. Neither are Mark, Luke, or John. Okay? Now, I didn't say you couldn't get an application. Especially in John, I, I think it's even easier uh, because of the way it's written, and I'll get to that later when we go to the book of John. There's applications. And, there's, and, and by the way, there's doctrinal teaching that never changes throughout the ages. But there are some clear distinctions that just, it's not the same. And, and, and you know that, so I won't belabor that point. But look in Matthew 5. I could take you through the, back, the book of Matthew and show you how it's, it's transpiring. The events recorded by Matthew transpire under the dispensation of law. Christ, when he gave what is commonly called the Sermon on the Mount, what he was doing is he was restating and revising the law in preparation for the kingdom to be established. He's the lawgiver. He has the right to do it. Just like Moses restated the law to Israel when they were about to enter in the land and made some revisions uh, by the Spirit of God. Of course, he didn't do it himself, but God uh, caused him to do that. So Christ is doing that, and he's teaching law. Matthew 5, verse number 17, the Bible says, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So there must be preservation of Scripture. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach... And what commandments? The commandments that he's giving, but these commandments are in accordance with the law. It is law. He said, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Of course, the Pharisees had outward form, but Christ, he puts the emphasis on not only doing right outwardly, but being right in the heart. He said, when you give alms, it's not just about giving alms. It's about doing it with the right heart, not trying to be seen of men. He even said, if you even look on a woman to lust after her in your heart, you have committed adultery with her already. See, God knows the heart. So he's not just saying, somebody said, well, I didn't didn't do the act, but you're an adulterer at heart. And the reason why people commit adultery is because that's what they are in the heart. God knows the heart. So, I mean, he, he's teaching law, and he's teaching it in a pure... What he's teaching is pure law and pure religion. That's what he's teaching. And there are moral principles that he teaches, of course, that still apply, but there's some things here. Of course, in Matthew 6, verse number 12, in this model prayer he gave his disciples, which is commonly miscalled the Lord's Prayer. This is a model prayer. It's very dispensational. And um, it'd be pretty ridiculous for you to repeat this prayer and think it means anything today. I mean, somebody, I heard somebody recently talking about they were in a, actually at a school, a public school. This happened years ago. Not that long ago, I don't think. But it happened a while back. And they were in a meeting and there was uh, a bunch of ambulances and stuff you could hear outside the door. And people were like, man, somebody must have just gotten a bad accident. Something's going on. And, and one of the persons said, we ought to pray about this. And they stopped and said, our Father, which art in heaven. And everybody started repeating it. That, what is that? That is not even the point of what he's doing here. That, that would be just vain repetitions. You need to pray with an intelligent understanding of where you are in God's program. You need to talk to God from the heart, not just repeat some prayer. And he never gave this for the intent for it just to be repeated like it is in religion today. But in this prayer, he says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. That's verse 10, as it is in heaven. So if you prayed that in this age, you'd be saying, Lord, in the age of grace and bring in your wrath. Right? Give us this day our daily bread. And you got two loaves of bread in the pantry. It just doesn't make sense, and it's not scripturally right for you to pray this prayer and think it means anything. But... He said, especially verse number 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's opposite of what Paul taught. Paul taught under grace, you forgive because you are forgiven. But yet preachers, how many? most preachers, they preach that all the time. Bless God, if you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. 
Well, if you die with unforgiven sin, where would that put you? Heaven or hell? Hey, all my sins are forgiven. And if I want to hold a grudge and be bitter, that's my prerogative. I'm still going to heaven. (laughs) I may not enjoy the trip, but I, I can do it if I want to. But I don't, you know, I shouldn't want to do that. I should be a forgiving person. But it doesn't affect my justification. Now, boy, i got a lot to look at. <laughs> look at the clock there. Um, so that's law, okay? That's law. Look at chapter 8. I won't give you all the verses. I can give you, I can give you a bunch of them. Chapter 8, I'll just give you one more. Verse 4, And Jesus says, saith unto him, See thou tell no man. He just cleansed this leper. But go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded. For a testimony to them. Talking about a sacrifice. He's talking about going to the to the temple, to the priest, and going through what the law prescribed for a leper to do. Which an amazing thing, you know, you had in the law all the scripture about what to do in the case of a leper, and if a leper gets cleansed, but the funny thing is, no lepers really were ever cleansed. I mean you read about Naaman, who's a Gentile, by the way. Uh but all that time, the priest probably thought, why is this in the Scripture? <laughs> and all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. you got lepers coming there every day, cleansed. It's a sign. And you can go through there. And uh, all the way through Matthew, I can show you verses about the law. Now, um, in his gospel, look at Matthew 1. In his gospel, Matthew presents Christ as the promised king. Now, that is the emphasis. And start off with verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Um, There's only one other place in the Bible where you read something like that. The book of the generation. And that's in Genesis 5, verse 1. The book of the generations of Adam. And you compare the passages and you have generations, plural, generations, singular, just a spiritual picture here. I know the men mentioned in Matthew 1 died. However, it's interesting when you go to Genesis 5, that, that is the repetitive phrase, and he died, and he died, and he died. And he didn't say nothing about that here. Because in Adam all shall die, but in Christ all shall live. Right? And so, interesting to compare that. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Well... That tells you right off the bat something important about what's going on here with Matthew. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Um, God made an everlasting covenant with Abraham, who is the father of the Hebrew people. You go to Genesis 12, 15, 17, and he confirmed it to Isaac and to Jacob. And I won't get into that covenant, but it had to do with him being you know, a great nation and having a land and being a blessing Uh, to all the families of the earth, and all the stuff we can look at, and it's an everlasting, unconditional covenant. And then he also made an everlasting covenant with David concerning his throne and concerning his kingdom. You can go to 2 Samuel 7. And so when I I look here and it says the son of David, the son of Abraham, that that connects me then to these covenants that God made with, with uh, with Israel. And we know that Christ came to confirm those promises. And that's what Paul said in Romans 15, 8. He came to confirm the promises made to the fathers. And so you can basically, you want a simple outline of Matthew? You can't get more simple than that. Matthew 1, 1 gives you the outline. Jesus Christ as the son of David, chapters 1 through 12. Jesus Christ as the son of Abraham, chapters 13 through 28. Who came first, David or Abraham? I hope you know the answer to that. Okay, but why is it listed in that order? Well, the book of Matthew starts off, look, who's the son of David? Solomon. And Solomon had a kingdom of peace and of power. And I know he got messed up, but in some ways Solomon was a type of Christ in his kingdom glory. Who's the son of Abraham? He's Isaac. Isaac, in a figure, was offered up. And so you have... The kingdom proclaimed in the first part of the book and the king being rejected in the latter part of the book. Okay, There's more to it than that, but I don't have time to get into that much. But that's a simple outline. 
Now, there are 28 chapters. That's four times seven. Four is the number of the earth. Seven is the number of perfection. And this has got to do with God's perfect program and plan for His kingdom being established on the earth. And they, um, the word kingdom is found 56 times in Matthew. <laughs> okay? That's important to understand. And the term kingdom of heaven is found 32 times and it's only found in the book of Matthew. Look in chapter 3. Verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye! Who's the ye? It's Israel. It's the Jews. No doubt about it. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And so the Bible said the law and the prophets prophesied until John. So in the Old Testament, it's prophecy. Beginning with Matthew, it's fulfillment of that prophecy. John the Baptist came in fulfillment of prophecy, preparing the way of the Lord. He's the forerunner. He's announcing that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Kingdom of heaven, chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, Israel was in a covenant relationship with God. They were not living right according to that covenant. They needed to bring forth fruits, meet for repentance, this is not nowhere close to the gospel we preach today. Okay, our emphasis is not on repentance, it's on believing the gospel. A sinner that believes the gospel has changed his mind, if you want to say it that, but you don't, if you emphasize repentance, you're emphasizing the wrong thing. Their emphasis needs to be on faith and it needs to be on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So, I believe that, again, the, con the basic concept of changing the mind, of if a sinner wants to be saved from his sin and wants to believe in the Lord Jesus, that's a change of mind. But the way, you, the way that happens is you preach the gospel and tell them to believe on the Lord. You don't tell them to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance, and all this stuff. That's a different message. And so, when it says kingdom of heaven, it's not talking about God's kingdom in heaven. It's not talking about going to heaven as preachers usually you, uh, think it means. What it is, the kingdom of heaven is the God of heaven establishing His kingdom on the earth. Matthew 6, 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on where? Earth as it is where? In heaven. Kingdom of heaven. Daniel 2, 44 talks about the kingdom being established on the earth and it says the God of heaven is going to put His kingdom on the earth. Daniel 2, 44. And, uh, and so that's the emphasis concerning uh, the kingdom and the prophecies. And uh, boy, there's so many to give you. Uh, Jeremiah 23, 5 is a great one. Jeremiah 23, 5. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Okay? Now, the gospel of the kingdom then is the good news that the promised kingdom was at hand. And, and there's so much in the Old Testament about this kingdom, and now it's finally at hand. And so the twelve apostles, they go forth preaching the gospel of the kingdom without even believing Jesus is going to die on the cross, be buried, and rise from the dead. Okay? So it doesn't take a, a genius to figure out the gospel of the kingdom is not the gospel of the grace of God. It just takes believing what you're reading in the Bible. That's not a deep thing at all. I, my children understand that. Okay? And yet we got preachers today who fight that and get mad about it, and their problem is not that they don't understand. They don't want to understand. Now, the term kingdom of God. The term kingdom of God is used 70 times in the New Testament. And uh, only eight times by Paul but 70 times in the rest of the Scripture in the New Testament. It is found five times in Matthew and 50 times in the other three Gospels. Now, some people make a big to-do out about the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, and they say the kingdom of God is always spiritual, which is not true. Okay? And you can't use Romans 14. That's so 
If you understand the context of what's said in Romans 14, when he said the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, you cannot use that verse to say that every time you read kingdom of God is talking about the spiritual kingdom. Listen, God is an eternal king. All right? Paul said, now unto the king eternal. 1 Timothy 1, 17. Well, if he's an eternal king, guess what he has? He has an eternal kingdom. can't have a kingdom without a king. And what kind of king is it that doesn't have a kingdom? Okay? So, the kingdom of God is a general designation that's wide and could refer to the eternal spiritual aspect of God's kingdom. It's in that sense you and I are in the kingdom of God. That's true, but the kingdom of heaven is a specific designation. You know what it is? It's the kingdom of God established on the earth. Okay? When you have the kingdom of heaven set up on the earth, guess what you have present on the earth? The kingdom of God. Okay? So that, that's why then, that's why then that uh, the terms are used actually interchangeably. Kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. I can, and I, I don't have time to do this. I got a lot of references here, but I got to move on. But I can show you that it's interchangeable. Okay, so that kingdom of God is, is, is going to, it's not going to be, it's not going to help you in your Bible study if you have the faulty idea that every time you see kingdom of God in the in the Bible, it's talking about a spiritual eternal kingdom and not God's kingdom on the earth, because Christ talked about eating and drinking in the kingdom of God. And seeing Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and even Gentiles coming and sitting down in the kingdom of God and the children of the kingdom being cast out. He talked about it in a visible earthly sense. Okay? I don't have time to prove that. If you're interested, I can give you those references later. I've got to, I've got to hurry. Now, so listen, Christ, did, and I say all that for several reasons, one of which is this. Christ did not come to establish a spiritual kingdom. Okay? That... 90% of preachers talk about, He came to put His kingdom in our hearts, you know, and He came, He didn't come to, to actually put a kingdom on the earth. Oh, those, those dumb Jews misunderstood Him, you know, and His apostles were so ignorant, they misunderstood. He, they thought He was talking about an earthly, He was talking about an earthly kingdom. They knew what the prophecy said. On earth, right? Why would He come as, does it even make sense? If, if the kingdom of God is eternal, why would He have to come establish it? It's been established. Okay? What He came to establish was that kingdom on earth. And so, rejecting God's commandment to rightly divide the word of truth, the covenant theologians, they have to, what they call, spiritualize, but it's not very spiritual, the literal promises that God made to the literal nation of Israel and say Christ did not come to... He came to bring a spiritual kingdom and now we're spiritual Israel. All that is a bunch of nonsense. I'll tell you, if you're a spiritual Jew, if you're a Jew and you get saved and you walk in the Spirit, that makes you a spiritual Jew. But to have a spiritual Jew, you've got to start with a Jew. Just like to have a baked potato, you've got to start with a potato. I'm not trying to be mean, but I get sick of some of this stuff because this is the stuff that's preached constantly and it's just not so. And to make matters worse, they turn around then and accuse dispensationalists of making Christ out to be a failure because we teach the kingdom was postponed and will be established later. And, they, and I've had guys tell me this, oh, you, so you think Christ failed? No, I don't think Christ failed. He knew from eternity past what would happen. It was all according to His plan. Who failed was Israel. Okay, Who fails is man, not God. And every dispensation in time ends with the failure of man and the judgment of God. Okay, So Christ did not fail, His people did. And let me tell you this, if you reject dispensational truth, what you're going to do is you're literally going to make God out to be an unfaithful liar. Because God made promises and you're saying He's not going to fulfill them like He said. And that's a dangerous thing. Now, let me close this morning with the simple outline. You can write this down if you want. It's kind of lengthy, but it's, it's, a, it's pretty simple. I actually took this outline from Brother Reese's commentary. I think he probably took it from somebody else, so who knows where it originated. But you have, in Matthew, it's the emphasis on the king and his kingdom. 
the right of Christ to rule as king on the earth, you have the legal right in chapter 1, his royal lineage. You have his royal right in chapter 2. He is born king of the Jews. Um, No man is born king, but he is because he's God manifest in the flesh. He's born king of the Jews. The prophetic right in chapter 3, you have his prophesied forerunner showing up and preparing the way and the the baptism of repentance and all this. Then the moral right in chapter 4, he is the righteous king. He is tempted of the devil in the wilderness and, and it's proven that he is indeed the son of God and he defeats the devil and his temptations. Then you have the legislative right in chapters 5 through 7, where he is giving the law of the kingdom. Then the miraculous right, according to prophecy, after chapters 8 through 11, there's an emphasis on all these signs and wonders of the kingdom. Then you come to chapter 12, which is a very pivotal chapter, and there's the warning of the unpardonable sin, which is something Israel committed, not something you can commit today. Uh, but that's another lesson for another time. I, 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 most people, they, they, they try to bring that into this age and teach it. And, and it's just, if you look at the context, it's clear what he's dealing with. And it's clear what happened with Israel concerning the matter. Then you have, from chapters 13 through 26, basically Christ is withdrawing. And uh, he's still doing some signs and wonders and whatever. But it's just a different, he's kind of... He's, he is, what he's mainly doing is he's preparing his disciples. And they don't fully know until after his resurrection some of the things he's trying to teach them in this passage. But he's preparing them for his rejection and his absence. Then you have chapter 27, the crucifixion of the king. They say, we'll not have this man to reign over us. And over his cross it's written, the king of the Jews. And then you have the resurrection, praise the Lord of the king, in chapter 28. And then he is... And then uh, he sends out his apostles with that same ministry concerning the kingdom. Uh, Quickly now, a couple more things right quick. Concerning his earthly ministry, uh, you want another simple thing? Matthew 4, 17. There's two divisions. Matthew 4, 17. It said, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From that time he began to preach. Repent, the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Then you come to chapter 16 and verse 21. From that time forth, Jesus began, or from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples. Now, I'm no um, scholar, but if from that time forth began Jesus, that tells me what he's about to say he didn't say before this. Okay? He began to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And they didn't believe a word of it. Okay? Which is his death, burial, and resurrection, of course, is the very basis of our gospel uh, uh, of the grace of God that we preach today. It's the good news of his death. But they didn't even understand this at all. All right? So it's a different thing. Now, let me give you this last outline. I'll just throw it up here because i only got like two minutes. But, and that's this. Look, many wrongly think that Christ, even those who understand the kingdom issue somewhat, that they limit that to the first part of Matthew. And then, they, and then they think that Christ began to reveal the present mystery age in chapter 13. The parables. After it was clear he was being rejected, then he began to talk about this age in which we're living. And that's what the Schofield Bible presents. But that's not so. The parables are mysteries of the kingdom. In other words, it was further revelation about the kingdom not found in the Old Testament prophets, which will help you a lot in understanding Daniel 9, because he was cut off, but not for himself, And the next thing you have there is the kingdom being established. But there's an interval there that the prophets didn't know. And that's covered by these mysteries of the kingdom and the parables. Now, when Christ declared, I'll build my church in Matthew 16, he was not revealing a new purpose. He was confirming the fact he would accomplish what he came to do, even though he was going to suffer first. And so... Right after he announced that he would build his church, and, he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and that's on the basis of the rock that he's the Christ, the Son of God. And it, church is a called out assembly. He's talking about that kingdom, the Jews being called out and assembled in their land and serving him. And he confirms in Matthew 17 
by the Mount of, on the Mount of Transfiguration, his kingdom glory will be established. He is not announcing anything new. He's confirming what he came to do. And you have that. Oh boy, I got to. Let me just say a word. Matt, Isaiah 2, read it. The mountain of the Lord's house. This is the kingdom. In the Bible, mountain is symbolic of kingdom. And you have four mountains, especially you need to take note of in Matthew. You have the charter of the kingdom given from a mount. You have the vision of the kingdom given on the mount. You have the signs of His coming kingdom given on a mount. Mount Olivet, Matthew 24 and 25. Then you have the kingdom commission from a mount, Matthew 28. So when He tells them to teach all nations, that's still the kingdom program. Israel, a kingdom of priests to the nations, teaching them the law. Matthew 28 has absolutely nothing to do with us doctrinally. Not our commission, not at all. Now, obviously, God still wants His Word to go to the world, but we better make sure we're taking the right message. And I had to do that so briefly, but that's just an overview of Matthew. So, from beginning to end in Matthew, it's the kingdom all the way through.